Hello and welcome to today's CCS Talks webinar from the Global CCS Institute. Um, this is our latest in our series of webinars to highlight key trends and developments for carbon capture and storage technologies and projects globally. My name is Lucy Temple-Smith. I'm a senior advisor at the Institute's advocacy, in the Institute's advocacy team and I'm based in Melbourne. Today's webinar it's titled Carbon Net Project, a Hub for Climate Change Action and Economic Growth. For those who are not familiar with the Institute, we're an international think tank with a mission to accelerate the deployment of carbon capture, story, carbon capture and storage globally. Um, CCS is a vital technology to reduce emissions to net zero and to reach global climate change targets. We are backed by governments, businesses and NGOs, and we've got offices around the world, headquartered here in Melbourne, also have offices in Washington DC, London, Brussels, Beijing and Tokyo. So for the webinar today, you can adjust your view through the toolbar at the top of your screen. If you can't see that toolbar, it will be due to you being on full screen mode. So um, just click off that and you should be able to see it. We will collect questions today. So please use the question panel on your GoToWebinar screen and we will collate those questions. And towards the end, I'll be fielding some questions with the panelists and also just having a general discussion towards the end. So we'd really appreciate questions throughout the presentation. Apologies if we can't get through all of the questions today, but we'll certainly try our best. Also to note today's webinar is being recorded. All registrants for today, whether you're joining live or not, will be sending you the webinar recording. Also a carbon net video that you'll see today and the slides will also be provided. If you're on Twitter and are following along, please at mention us at Global CCS and also use the hashtag CCS Talks. I'd like now our presenters to um, turn their cameras on and I'll introduce them one by one. If they could just give a little wave as I do that so we can identify who's who. So joining me today from the Carbon Net Project, we have Steve Marshall, who's the Operations Director. Nick Hoffman, who's the Geo-Sequestration Advisor, and Amanda Harding, who's the Stakeholder Engagement and Communications Manager. And my colleague from the Global CCS Institute, Alex Zapantis, who's one of our General Managers for the commercial team. Welcome to all of our presenters today. So to get started today, I'm going to um, ask Alex Zapantis to start with his presentation. Alex will be taking us through a little bit about the global status of CCS and also speaking about some hub and cluster information and giving us some examples of international hubs and clusters. Thanks very much, Alex. Well, thank you very much for that, Lucy. Um, I very much am the support act for this uh, webinar today. It's actually all about carbon net, so I will be quite brief. But I think it's appropriate that I spend a little bit of time uh, just over about eight slides or so talking about uh, uh, some contextual information, which I think is quite interesting. The first is that um, over recent years, the past three years, in fact, there has been quite strong year-on-year -year growth in the CCS pipeline, as you can see from this chart. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is really quite straightforward. It goes back to the increased recognition of the urgency of action on climate change, um, uh, which really started around 2015 with the Paris Agreement and then it has taken off since then. Um, uh, for example, right now the, 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 the common target which is most commonly articulated is net zero. Uh, that's, fairly, that's fairly new. Uh, only a few years ago the discussion was focused on deep reductions in emissions, now it's net zero. And this has driven a lot more rigorous analysis of how to achieve net zero. Um, uh, and of course the result of that is the answer uh, you get when you do the rigorous analysis is that you need every possible low emissions technology and energy efficiency technology to achieve net zero. And CCS is absolutely critical as one of those technologies, one of many technologies, particularly in, in, in the industrial sectors where in many instances there are no feasible alternatives other than to capture the carbon dioxide that's produced uh, as a process emission uh, and, then to, and then to store that, uh, that, that CO2 uh, permanently uh, in deep geological storage uh, reservoirs. 
Another strong driver of interest in, in CCS in recent times, of course, has been hydrogen. Um, you know, hydrogen has, has been recognised as playing a major role potentially in decarbonisation of transport, of industry, of heat, uh, and, uh, and even in the power sector. Uh, and right now, of course, the lowest cost uh, source of clean hydrogen is uh, uh, from, from uh, gas reformation or coal gasification with carbon capture from storage. So all these factors have combined to drive much greater interest in CCS. Companies are, uh, are recognising climate change as a more significant and uh, nearer term strategic risk, striving them to look at options of decarbonising their businesses. Governments are looking for pathways towards net zero uh, and, uh, and it, uh, that's driving them to identify CCS as one of many technologies that are necessary to deploy. And this ultimately is all being driven by a stronger expectation of civil society. So the next slide, please, uh, uh, Lucy. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the current um, status of CCS, I guess, is the slide that we present very often. Uh, and what you can see on that slide is each CCS facility uh, plotted roughly versus time, um, and also by the industry to which the CCS facility uh, is being applied. And you can see right now there are 21 facilities uh, operating. Uh, the first of those started operating nearly 50 years ago in 1972. Uh, the most recent facility started operating only a, a month or so ago uh, in, um, in Canada. And each of these facilities is capturing hundreds of thousands of tonnes of carbon dioxide each year. Some, some are capturing millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide each year uh, and injecting that safely into the ground. Um, over the past little while, as I mentioned uh, previously, there's been uh, quite a significant growth in the pipeline. And the lighter blue circles there represent facilities which are in advanced development. Uh, advanced development essentially means feasibility studies or front-end engineering and design um, or even detailed design. Um, and this uh, uh, recent activity, as I mentioned, has been instigated or incentivized by the expectation uh, of uh, more stringent climate policy driven by the recognition of uh, uh, the need for more urgent action uh, on, um, on, on climate change. Most of the facilities are in industrial applications, not power. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's simply cheaper to capture CO2 uh, from many industrial processes, which produce high concentration CO2 streams. Power production produces relatively low concentration CO2, so it's more expensive to capture. Um, hence, uh, there are less of those operating. But as you can see, um, there are six or seven uh, power generation projects that are now in advanced development, which will add to the two that are currently operating. Next slide, thank you, Lucy. So the value of CCS, what is the value of CCS? Well, you know, the only reason you would do CCS, of course, is for climate mitigation purposes. That is the value, the primary value of CCS. Um, but the secondary contributors to its value are, are really its versatility. CCS can be applied uh, to any uh, industrial carbon dioxide source. Uh, it's actually a family of technologies, not a single technology. Um, and there are different technologies that are applicable to different kinds of CO2 sources, including most recently the atmosphere. Direct, direct air capture of CO2 is now, uh, is now being developed. Um, it allows dispatchable low carbon power to be produced. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is the lowest cost source of hydrogen, uh, clean hydrogen today, and, and will remain so at least until 2030 and most likely well beyond 2030, except in very limited circumstances. Uh, right now, there are seven, I think, uh, facilities operating, uh, producing hydrogen and storing the CO2, and the largest of those is producing 1,300 tonnes of hydrogen per day. Um, so it's already operating at scale uh, with CCS, um, and in fact has been operating since 1982, some of those facilities, so it's well-established technology. Um, it also, obviously, uh, as with any development, CCS is not special here, investment in CCS will create jobs. But what it can do also is help to provide a just transition for communities that currently rely upon um, uh, uh, high emissions industries uh, for their employment and, and for economic activity in their, in their regions. Uh, what CCS can do is it can take those high emissions industrial clusters, which currently exist around the world in many places, turn them into low, near zero or even zero emissions clusters, uh, enable those communities to continue to uh, benefit economically and socially uh, from the natural resources that they have access to. So it does have a pretty important role uh, in, in providing a just transition for, for those kinds of communities. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Lucy. 
So this slide really is a cartoon that, that tries to uh, convey the concept of a, a CCS hub and cluster. Um, if you look at the recent growth in the pipeline of CCS facilities, what you'll find is that almost all of them are associated with a hub and cluster. And there's a reason for that. Um, the first reason are the economies of scale that uh, uh, you get from um, uh, co-locating numerous sources of carbon dioxide and establishing common user CO2 transport and storage infrastructure to manage that, uh, that carbon dioxide. You can achieve quite significant cost savings, unit, unit cost savings through those economies of scale. Also significant are the commercial and technical synergies that hubs and clusters offer. Uh, they create uh, industrial ecosystems with multiple suppliers and, and multiple customers for CO2 uh, management services. So they reduce that cross-chain risk that would otherwise exist if there was simply one source and one sink. And if either the source or the sink fails, then the whole business model fails. Um, but also the co-location of industries uh, benefit from the concentration of supply, uh, supply chains, the availability of factors of production, skilled labour, etc. In fact, that's the reason why many industrial clusters already exist without CCS. Um, uh, as I said previously, transfer transforming those existing uh, high emissions industrial clusters into low emissions industrial clusters not only will allow uh, many of the current um, uh, economic uh, activities to continue, but they will provide foci which will attract uh, uh, industries that require a carbon management solution. So there's a significant opportunity here uh, to create new uh, low emissions industries around these hubs once that infrastructure has been established and those carbon management uh, services are available. Next slide, please, uh, Lucy. This slide shows um, uh, not all, but most, I guess it's most, um, of the uh, hubs and clusters that are currently being developed around the world. In fact, these were the hubs and clusters that were in development, which had significant advancement in 2019. There are actually actually more than, the, than, than, I, than I showed uh, uh, on, on, the, on this slide. And you can see that they all, most of them contain a number of different potential sources, a number of different industries uh, from which CO2 can be captured, um, all clustered around, obviously, uh, good geological storage um, resources. Next slide, please, uh, Lucy. This is one example. Uh, it's the Northern Lights um, cluster. Uh, and as you can see, the ambition of this particular uh, CCS cluster is to receive CO2 from all over Europe. Um, the, the carbon dioxide will be transported by a ship um, and will be stored in a geological storage resource uh, uh, beneath the seabed just off the coast um, of Norway. The first two projects uh, that uh, would provide carbon dioxide uh, to this uh, hub um, uh, are in Norway. One of them is on a waste to energy plant, and the second one is on a, uh, is on a cement plant. Next slide, please, uh, Lucy. This um, uh, hub and cluster is the zero carbon Humber cluster in the United Kingdom. You'll notice that it contains the Drax power station. Now, the Drax power station is worth speaking about a little bit um, because what they've done at Drax is they've converted, um, uh, uh, I think, a few 660 megawatt units of that previously coal-fired power station uh, to 100% biomass-fired uh, uh, power. And they are currently trialling a capture unit on one of, those, uh, one of those units. It's a very small capture unit. It's a pilot. It's only capturing about one tonne of CO2 per day. Um, at the moment, I think. Um, but uh, what Drax demonstrates is the ability of that power station actually to become a negative emissions um, facility in that it would run on biomass, sustainable biomass, um, which draws CO2 from the atmosphere during growth. Uh, the CO2 captured from the uh, 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 combustion of that biomass in the production of, of electricity would then be captured and stored as part of this uh, uh, zero carbon um, Humber uh, uh, hub and cluster. Equinor very recently announced that they're going to build a hydrogen production plant uh, as part of this same part of this same uh, facility. Um, uh, sorry, part of this same uh, uh, hub and cluster, uh, with the CO2 being being captured and stored from that uh, hydrogen uh, plant uh, and stored in the same storage um, uh, resource. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Lucy, and um, allow Carbonet to get on to the uh, the main game. 
Thanks so much, Alex. Um, really interesting overview there of both where CCS is at, as well as some of the incredible hub and cluster projects that are happening in Europe. And speaking of those projects, we'll now have the Carbonet team present their slides. Um, as I mentioned, we have Steve, Nick and Amanda from the team with us today, and they'll be taking us through all of the detail around the Carbonet project, including the stakeholder and community engagement side of the project. So we will be, um, throughout the presentation as well, running a short video. So I will hand over now to the Carbonet team. Thank you, Lucy, and, uh, and thanks, Alex, and the Global CCS Institute for the opportunity to talk about uh, Carbonet. Uh, next slide, please, Lucy. So, Carbonet is a project uh, funded jointly by the Victorian State Government and the Commonwealth Government of Australia, and it's looking at multi-user uh, CCS project uh, in the southeast part of the, the state and around the Gippsland area. Uh, what you can see down there in the bottom right hand side just indicates why it's such a great opportunity. Uh, offshore, we've got large natural gas and oil deposits in the, uh, in the Gippsland Basin, which obviously has excellent uh, storage capacity, mirrored onshore by industrial hubs and shown as well uh, brown coal resources. So a very rich region uh, for natural resources uh, and industry there. That entire basin has a potential for about 31 gigatons of storage going forward. So this is really just the start of what could be a very, very world-class uh, leading asset. Next one, please, Lucy. So the Victorian government has a, a host of commitments made in 2017. Um, like everything, to achieve our climate goals, you've got to do a little bit of everything. That's renewables, that's looking at fuel switching, that's looking at efficiencies, carbon capture and storage uh, is a part of that. And that's why CarbonNet sits underneath and is run by the Victorian State Department for jobs, precincts uh, and regions. So we're a key pillar to our long-term goals of net zero emissions, as Alex mentioned earlier on. That's a working term that everybody is familiar with nowadays. And um, what I'd like to do now, Lucy, if we may, is go to the CarbonNet project video. It runs for just over three minutes and it gives a, a quite a high level and good overview uh, of the project. If it's unable to run or the sound is not working, it will be shared with the rest of the um, the material after this one. So, Lucy, if you could play that video, please.
Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for playing that, Lucy. Go to the next slide. Hopefully that gives everybody a bit of an overview of um, of carbon net and uh, what our goal is. And you saw some of the images there of the uh, the amazing environment that we get to work in. The project has been progressing for the past um, pretty much a decade. We're now in what we call stage three project development, which is about focusing on de-risking um, de the, the project from both the storage site and the transportation network, and then commencing our commercialization uh, aspects and discussing with existing industries and looking at new industries willing to move into uh, Victoria and take the opportunity to utilize the storage network. Um, and it's very great to see Alex showing so many examples of hubs around the world and what carbon net can also mirror here in Australia. Lucy, can you go into the next slide, please? So what does it look like, the future vision? So down in Gippsland, um, just initially, we've also, uh, before I go into this, looked at the potential for linking other, other parts of the states and potentially taking some lessons learned from uh, some of the projects like Northern Lights about shipping transformation, but just looking down in Gippsland in the Latrobe Valley, we've got existing fossil power generation, natural gas processing, other industries that are there, but those emerging industries that are starting to be enabled through hydrogen production, fertilizer production, and looking at direct air capture. So successful implementation of the project, you know, it's going to look at safeguarding existing jobs as those industries transition into a low emissions future, introduce new industries, uh, to the, the local area and then capitalise on the existing skill sets of a resource basis that's been focused on oil and gas, fossil fuel extraction uh, over the last uh, multiple decades. And it's really looking at then the regional opportunities and uh, getting jobs into a region um, that's so critical to Victoria. Next slide, please. So stage three, just an overview. And I'll, uh, Nick and Amanda will run through some of this. We've continued looking at our transportation and storage network. We've already got, we're beyond feasibility. We've got a pipeline network that collect, connects multiple existing uh, sites in the Latrobe Valley to our storage network uh, offshore. Uh, and we've conducted uh, a whole series of appraisal activities in the offshore environment, predominantly in and around our Pelican site that Nick will take everybody through just now. On a commercial establishment, we're working with industries and we went out to it with an industry engagement at the start of this year, looking to see what industry is looking for. So obviously there's a technical part, there's a scientific side, but a lot of CCS is moving on from that now. And it's really about the enabling policy. What are the economic drivers? What are the opportunities for jobs here? So we're working uh, in consultation with industry and the government at the state and Commonwealth level on that. And finally, around the government's compliance and engagement. So Amanda will go to a lot about how we engage with industry and with the public most critically, and some of the key lessons we've learned there. But we are also, being a government agency, we've got to go through exactly the same rules, regulations, and checks effectively as oil and gas have to do uh, for their uh, operations offshore. Uh, but we also go through that because it's a first of a kind project offshore in Australian waters, testing the existing regulations that actually exist. Are they suitable for other projects? not least just for carbon net going forward. Next slide, please. One of the key things that we've been working to in the last uh, couple of years, uh, and there's nothing uh, like drilling a well to in, uh, improve the visibility of a project, we drilled an appraisal well on the Pelican site. It's the first well to be drilled offshore. It was drilled in December and January just this last year. Um, during that time, Victoria was also going through bushfires along with New South Wales and other parts of Australia. Um, some of the risks that you associate with drilling a well are not about also having to deal with uh, the amount of smoke that's coming down and operating around that, that area. So it's a very challenging time, but it's completed very successfully. The operations themselves are regulated by NOPTA and NOPSIMA, same as oil and gas. Uh, we're fully compliant. We had a very extensive formation evaluation program that was targeted at reducing some of the uncertainties that we have. Bearing in mind on the structure, we completed a 3D marine seismic survey in 2018, and there's an existing well and structure, structure that was drilled uh, previously. It really ramped up our st stakeholder engagement, and Amanda Harding will talk to that, uh, including public, the media, and industry. Um, there's a lot to talk about uh, when you're drilling a well and bringing something in like this, specifically being government. 
and the results to date are pretty positive. Nick will uh, will run through that. It's aligned to our pre pre drill expectations, but we're confident that the the uh, the structure can take at least five million tons of CO2 per year. Next one, Lucy, please. So appraisal. It's it's more than operations. There's been a number of projects around the world that have done significant appraisal in the last uh, couple of years. Um, you see there are a couple of key pictures. So the seismic survey that was completed in 2018 had to come just about one and a half kilometers close to the shoreline. That's the cover of our structure in its whole. Uh, that presents a lot of challenges. Uh, it's, it's visible to the public there. And it's fair to say that we learned a lot through our stakeholder engagement about what the public expectations are about being informed of what's going on, why we're doing this, the potential risks, the opportunities uh, that are there. And we really listen to the local community and industry to try and take that forward and improve on uh, into the well. But it's an evolving thing. You've got to listen to people and continue to change how you engage, how you react. And definitely through the COVID uh, uh, crisis and pandemic that we're facing just now, we're going to have to further continue how we uh, engage with the public. But first of the kind, community engagement. What is CCS? Starting at the basics. Why here? Why in our backyard? Why in this region? Why would we invest in this? All these stories that I think we as an industry have got to talk better about why we're doing CCS. Um, it's not just about prolonging the life of fossil fuels. What are the opportunities? What are the next parts of the transitions to a low emissions future? How can that be enabled by CCS? Industrial relations, so dealing with a whole host of uh, organizations and companies that helped us with drilling the well, all our uh, service partners there, our neighboring tenement holders uh, in the oil and gas part, the fishing industry, uh, right the way through that was there. As I mentioned before about testing existing regulatory regimes, it's there. It's, it's There's a learning curve both for ourselves in planning and executing the operations, along with the regulator. Uh, some key things around uh, a simple thing about a safety zone around the rig that existed for petroleum and only existed then very late, close to the day, where we were about to bring the rig and start drilling. There's a safety zone um, around there. So we're really working as a team to ensure that all of our learnings as we progress through a project, we can keep that documented, we can work with the regulator, and then the next set of projects can actually learn from some of our uh, lessons going forward. And then media and social media. Um, I think it's very easy to put your head below the wall and not talk about what you're doing. And I think as an industry, we're starting to learn that and, and talk about it more openly, and more freely, and be willing to take on uh, criticism and questions uh, from industry, public, regulators, government about why we're doing that. Um, but we've certainly tried to learn a lot of lessons there. Next one, Amanda. Uh, Lucy, sorry. I'll very briefly go through this one. Um, spoken enough that it's a, it's a first of a kind. Uh, one of the key things that we have achieved uh, this year is amendment to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act to enable uh, projects like as ourselves to exist across two titles offshore, whether it's both Commonwealth waters or Commonwealth to state waters. Um, so that went through Parliament in uh, May of this year, something that's been a long process to, uh, to get done, but that amendment hopefully will be finalised by the end of this year. We also uh, have had international certification and review about our site selection through DNV, and they were also involved in, in uh, international peer review on what is the first regulatory process for Pelican, a declaration of storage. And Nick Hoffman will maybe talk a little bit about that in his, his discussions. Next slide, please. So one of the key things here is unlocking policies, taking the chains off. So around the world, a um, very significant shift, as Alex mentioned, about CCS, the confidence that's there. Government's talking about CCS being one of the key parts of a low emissions hub in our transition to net zero. Uh, in Australia, um, it's fair to say there's been a fundamental shift in government-led policy, specifically in the last six months, but really in the last year. So a couple of the, the, the key moves, obviously the Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act, they're being moved. Um, but really the King Review and then the Technology Investment Roadmap is really highlighting that there's a technology agnostic view to hitting our low, emission, uh, low emissions targets. Um, there's targets around the cost for CCS. There's targets around the cost for hydrogen going forward. And that's a, that's a work in progress. That's engagement by the government with industry to see what's actually required to move the needle. What can make uh, uh, 
economic decisions to proceed with projects such as carbon net by supporting with policy. It's no longer just a science or an engineering requirement. It's really the policy drivers that are required. So we, we, we work very closely with the state and Commonwealth governments and industry on a number of things uh, that's there. And I'm certainly happy to uh, to reach out to industry and get lessons learned from uh, around the world that's been successful in modifying their policies. Next one, please. We'll hand over at this stage to Nick Hoffman. Um, Nick, on you go, please. Good evening, everybody, or evening in Australia. It must be any time in the West, rest of the world. Can we move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the geoscience. Steve showed one reason why we're in the Gippsland Basin. He showed that uh, we've got a good location in terms of infrastructure, nearby industry and opportunity. There's another reason why we're there, and that is that it's a very good basin in geological terms. It was Australia's first and foremost oil producing basin. It has produced over 4 billion barrels of oil um, and about 4 TCF of gas and maybe another 3 or 4 TCF still to come. It is definitely a world class basin with very high quality reservoirs and an excellent aquifer supporting production from those reservoirs. There's never been a need for uh, pressure support of that aquifer and those billions of barrels of oil have been produced by uh, primary productivity only, and they produce about 85% of the oil that is in there, which is almost unheard of in world terms. There are over 1,500 exploration and development wells, and basic data on all of those wells is open file under the Australian Petroleum Regulations. So uh, any party can access that data and make their own evaluation of the geology of the basin. Other countries in the world don't have such an open data regime. We're very lucky there. We also have practically wall to wall 3D seismic data. Um, so we're starting from a position of strength. In terms of source and sink matching, Steve showed how close we are to industry. But what I want to talk about mostly today is injectivity. That is the ability of the reservoir to receive injected fluids. And the simplest way to calculate this, an initial guess for injectivity is the thickness of the reservoir multiplied by the permeability of the reservoir. It's a very simple concept, but by producing a diagram like the one on the left of this slide, we can analyze essentially all of the CCS projects in the world and see why some have been more successful than others. You'll see that the majority of the world projects lie in that white zone in the center that I call type two. Those are what would be called average or normal reservoirs, and they're perfectly good for onshore projects and in some circumstances they work offshore. They're, they're a little bit less suitable because of higher costs, but they can still work. In the green zone, the best reservoirs for CCS in the world are in the Sleipner project. It's absolutely fantastic. If you look down towards the bottom right, we are not quite as good as Sleipner, but we've got an order of magnitude better injectivity than many world projects. Uh, the test injection that we ran on Gular 1 showed that we had well over 100 Darcy meters of permeability uh, of reservoir, and that was injecting into a single 30 meter interval. For the future development, we will probably have three wells, each injecting into a separate 30 meter interval, so there's no pressure interference. And so we will multiply by three that test result and produce the uh, result that you see at the carbon net pelican site symbol. Down in the red is where nobody wants to be operating a large project, but it's fine to do research into CCS, even with limited reservoirs, because you can learn about uh, the technology and the infrastructure and the chemistry and the physics, even at a small scale. Can we move to the next slide, please? This is a repeat of Steve's earlier slide, slightly larger. The blue irregular shapes are our offshore greenhouse gas assessment permits 
Four of them are in Commonwealth waters, federal waters, and one of them is in Victorian state waters. And you can see there is one purple shape about center, left of center, and two blue shapes um, somewhat down to the bottom left from there. Those are our three potential storage sites. And you will see that thanks to mother nature, uh, these all overlap between at least two permits. So the idea that you can draw a line on the map and everything will be safely within it is very difficult. There's a gap between uh, the ideal of bureaucracy and the reality of geology. In reality, we have to amalgamate different permits in order to have a successful storage site. And work is progressing for a declaration of identified storage formation for at least two of these sites. We're working on Pelican, the purple one, left of center, and we're working on Kookaburra, which is the small one, um, the smaller of the two blue ones on the right-hand side. I'll describe those sites one by one, uh, Pelican and Kookaburra. Next slide, please. So the Pelican site, this is an oblique view of the structural geometry. The uh, paler or more muted colors are structural elevation, colored from brown at the top down through orange, yellow, green to blue. And the rather brighter colors are a map of where the CO2 that is injected will migrate over a period of 300 years. So you can see that after 300 years, the majority is collected in the crest of our structural anticline. It's quite buoyant and it moves up dip. We've chosen a down dip injector location very deliberately because this, this enables the CO2 on its way up to the crest to interact with more formation water, uh, to percolate through more of the reservoir, more of the pores, and we ended up we end up with a higher amount of dissolution of CO2, and we end up with more residual trapping of CO2. So there is less CO2 arriving at the crest of the structure. We've evaluated in quite a rigorous statistical method um, the storage resource that we have here. We have followed the Society of Petroleum Engineers CO2 Storage Resources Management System, and under that, system we have a contingent reserve we are contingent because we have not yet confirmed a commercial development there is no other factor holding us back um, the 1c reserves the uh, confirmed reserves which is essentially equivalent to the 90 percent certainty level are 125 million tons and that's our project requirement we actually have a, a 2c uh, at about the P50 level or the median of 250 million tons. So with a relatively simple injection scheme, we modeled one well and one injection interval. Um, we found that we could store 250 million tons in this structure. A more sophisticated scheme might find a higher value. And the upside of the structure is something like 500 million tons. This site is fully characterized and appraised. Um, it had a new high resolution marine 3D seismic survey. We have drilled the appraisal well, Gular 1, down dip at the injector location, at the future injector location. But that well has been plugged and abandoned because of the time value of money. By the time we get an offshore development going again, uh, the cost of keeping that well open will have exceeded its value. And technology is always moving. The technology that we may have in two, three or five years time will be different from the technology we would have had to have committed to today or last year to drill that well. We are evaluating the well results even as I speak. Next slide, please. So a little about the appraisal well. At top left, the very large drill bit is the initial bit that we used for uh, drilling the, the top hole section. Top right, um, there is the end of a core barrel that we have drilled and in the gloved hand, uh, debris is being collected and bottom left, that is being sorted with tweezers and carried to a microscope. So everything from a 20 inch 
heavy duty drill bit to tiny tweezers and picks are being used to examine the rocks. The location of this well was optimized on the basis of our 3D seismic survey. We drilled to a little over 1400 meters subsea into the storage reservoir. We went through several layers of reservoir and we tested one of those layers, the deepest layer. The stratigraphy was pretty much as predicted. Our depth forecasts were accurate within plus or minus 15 meters. And we recovered 89 meters of core from both seal and reservoir. Steve mentioned we had an extensive wireline logging pro program with uh, pressure tests, fluid recovery, and we had a 24 hour water injection test uh, at rates up to 10,000 barrels of water per day. The water was uh, sterilized and was compatible with the formation fluids. We have proven that seals are present. There is a pressure anomaly in the well related to drawdown from nearby production, and that defines different intervals of the stratigraphy that are more or less uh, depleted, which shows us which seals are working. The reservoirs are better than predicted. We had predicted an average of a little less than a Darcy, and we have found multi-Darcy reservoirs. And we used high specification alloys in the well construction and materials and plugged it with CO2 resistant cement. So it is a very low risk of any future liability. Next slide, please. The other site I want to tell you about is Cookaburra, which will be the next available storage site after Pelican. This is a large structural anticline, but not quite as large. It has substantial capacity. We are currently commencing the statistical uh, method of analyzing uh, its probabilistic storage volume. At the moment, I can only tell you that the 1C is likely to be around 125 million tons. We've tested a number of high risk cases and they have all successfully stored 125 million tons. This is a depleted oil field, relatively small, and it's due for abandonment in the next few years. We understand that production has already finished from this field. There is pre-existing marine 3D seismic data over the entire structure and five exploration and development wells, three of which have already been plugged and abandoned, and two of which are the uh, development wells for the oil field uh, that have yet to be abandoned. Our CO2 storage development plan will be based on this existing well and seismic data and the field production history, but in principle, we'll do something similar to Pelican, we'll inject down dip on the eastern flank uh, to take advantage of migration up into the structure, using up some of the CO2 before it arrives for storage. Thank you very much. I'll hand over there to Amanda. Next slide, please. And hello, uh, lovely to be here um, this evening in Australia. Um, Lucy, if we can have the first slide in the, um, in the stakeholder engagement deck. Thank you. So um, our objectives aren't necessarily um, unique. Uh, we want to build community awareness and confidence in CCS. We want to work towards establishing a social license for the project um, and obviously then achieve a broad advocacy for, the, um, for, for our project um, so that climate change mitigation, uh, new jobs, um, new industry and utilising existing skills in the Latrobe Valley region is something that people see as a positive um, and something that they obviously um, work with us to achieve. Next slide, please. So who are our stakeholders? Because really the people are, the, um, I suppose, key to stakeholder engagement. We've got our Gippsland community. There's the Shoreline community, which is uh, just around Golden Beach and Paradise Beach off the 90 mile beach in Gippsland. Um, and also the Latrobe Valley community. Two very different areas and they're both in different local government um, areas. So the Shoreline community are very close to where um, the activities will be um, occurring and that's where we've done a lot of consultation, a lot of information sessions 
and hopefully a lot of listening because that's what we've been um, really showing is so important with this project to listen to what people have to say, what they want to hear um, and, and to meet their expectations. In the Latrobe Valley, uh, there's, um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the infrastructure Stakeholders there are um, a very used to a um, very industrial type of um, environment. We have had, um, I, I'm actually based in the Latrobe Valley myself, and we've got um, power generators closing down um, in the next couple of decades. Uh, we have um, a timber industry um, further into Gippsland, which has got its own challenges. And then we've got renewables coming in. So it's quite a dynamic type of environment. We've got regulators in government, um, obviously all Victorians, all Australians, and our scientific and academic community. So we work with um, the National Science Organisation, CSIRO. We work with um, CO2, CRC, University of Melbourne, University of Wollongong, etc. cetera. Um, so we have a broad um, remit, I suppose, when it comes to stakeholders. Next one, please, Lucy. I'd like to um, spend a little bit of time out of my um, three minutes on stakeholder activities. Um, so we've done quite a bit in the area. Um, we've had a, a community sentiment survey that Peter Ashworth ran for us that looked at, uh, that was focus groups um, that were based around um, both Gippsland and also metropolitan Melbourne. So we really wanted to understand what people were saying. Um, and that study really showed us that there was a real um, need for information. People wanted to know what this technology was um, and what it could achieve. And you know, to use one quote, um, which is a very positive quote for us, um, this is part of the answer now. People should know about it. Uh, so obviously there's also people who were um, somewhat concerned about the technology, the impacts on the environment, etc. So that informs us um, in regards to what it is we need to uh, share with people in terms of the science behind the project, um, the robust, um, uh, uh, I suppose the robust information that we've collected in terms of our investigations um, and the huge pool of knowledge that exists globally around CCS. Uh, we had community information sessions, we've had 10 over the last three years um, in the localised shoreline community. We had also another five pop-up sessions while the uh, rig was uh, close to shore. Uh, we did have to forego one due to the bushfires. Uh, we have a community reference group in place that has uh, membership from across Gippsland. We have an education program, which is outreach into schools um, that teaches them about CCS and CCS in the context of climate change. Uh, we also have events and conferences. We held a great science week event um, last last year, we had about 300, 300 people attend. This year, we've had to change it a little bit because of COVID. Um, but again, we had really good traction locally. Um, media and social media um, are used extensively, both industry um, uh, publications and also mainstream media. Um, you may have seen a recent um, article in the Carbon Capture Journal. There's one there at the moment on CarbonNet if you'd like to do some background reading. Uh, we do a lot of knowledge sharing, so there's reports on our website. Um, and also we work with our, um, our project partners, such as the Hydrogen Energy Supply Chain, uh, who, are we, who are also based in Gippsland. Um, and that project is one of our capture sites or potential capture sites. They're currently in pilot. Uh, next slide, please, Lucy. So the next slide that we're going to see really just gives you a quick overview of what we've done in terms of media and community engagement most recently. Um, a few photos there from uh, Science Week last, last year with um, the hydrogen cupcakes, the science CO2 magic show, the sail drone that was borrowed from CSIRO. Um, then when we, we had uh, Channel 10, uh, who is a statewide um, uh, broadcaster, uh, come to our rig and also there was some tweets there. Um, the rig itself came into it at one point right into the Bay of Melbourne. So again, the media there, we had to be very aware of um, telling um, the right, or providing the right information and letting people know what this huge rig was doing um, just off the city skyline. Now, I think that's it for me, Lucy. And we're gonna pop over to um, Steve again. Thank you. Amanda and Nick, thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, so what are our next steps? So we're going to continue on the technical development and permitting of the of the two sites. 
uh, we're moving into looking at what is the feed work that's needed to be done to take uh, to take the Pelican site up to what may be a final investment decision going forward. Continue with our collaboration with industry and government about what are the requirements to actually get a project like this up and running, uh, and continue engagement with the, with the local community, as, as Amanda said. Um, one of the key things that we want to continue to do is discussions with industry, uh, other peer level projects, get their lessons, get their uh, get their learnings for for going forward. This is a fantastic uh, project. Uh, the scale of which the injection uh, and total storage capacity of the site is really driving down the cost that's there. So there's a really unique opportunity to maximise this world class asset going forward. Next slide, if I may, please, Lucy. So I want to thank everybody for, for attending this now. We've got uh, some, some questions uh, next. I want to thank all our valued partners, only some of which are, are shown there, for all the work that they've helped in us uh, developing uh, this fantastic asset that we have. And as, as said, um, we're very interested to hear from any interested parties that uh, are potentially looking to further the commercial development of the project. Uh, that can be industries that are existing uh, here in Australia, uh, looking to come in because of the low cost opportunity that this presents, uh, or investors going forward. So my details are there. You can reach out, but there's also a whole host of information on our website that's mentioned there. So I'll take this opportunity to also thank the Global CCS Institute for the opportunity to uh, discuss the project with you tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. And if I could ask all of our um, presenters to now start their videos back up. We've got some questions. We do have around five or six minutes to go through some questions. And um, hopefully I've got one here for, for everyone, but of course it's a open discussion. So please all of you feel free to contribute. Um, Alex, I'll start with you. Um, one very general one, if CCS is happening, I suppose this is off your initial slide showed the momentum in CCS, why is there not more in Australia? So can you well, talk I think, a little um, bit more about that? I can talk a little bit about that. So, so um, CCS, like many other low emission technology uh, options, um, is more expensive than conventional. Uh, options for producing the same outcome. Um, and CCS is unique in some ways in that it doesn't actually produce a product other than emissions abatement. Unlike renewable power, renewable energy produces electricity. There's a saleable product there that you can sell into a market very easily. CCS doesn't actually do that. CCS pro provides emissions abatement and needs to be applied to existing industrial facilities. So the reason why there hasn't been more activity in Australia, and I should say there actually has been a lot, just not at the, the, the very large commercial scale end of the spectrum, except for Gorgon, of course, which is the world's largest CCS facility, which is capturing 4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. It started operating uh, last year. Um, uh, the reason why there aren't more of these is because the business case is really a difficult one to mount. Um, now there are additional costs that CCS uh, projects uh, incur, uh, and, and the financial reward for incurring those costs generally isn't there. Um, in countries like the United States, where there are very good, uh, a strong uh, existing policy framework to support the business case, we see lots and lots of projects proceeding. Um, so really the only reason is business case, and every country is different, um, although it's starting to become more positive here in Australia as well. And I will mention Gorgon, the world's largest 4 million tonnes per year uh, being stored right here in Australia, off the northwest coast. Thanks, Alex. And you've mentioned the 4 million tonnes there, and um, there's a question around, and it's a good one, the, the 5 million tonnes that's been mentioned around the CarbonNet project, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of emissions? I think if we could, um, you all may want to jump in there, but what does that mean for someone who's out there and wants to know how to um, how to quantify that? What does that look like? So I guess in the video, it puts it in perspective about the number of cars. So it's about a million, 1.1 million uh, conventional cars that it takes off the road. If you're looking at one of the large industrial power stations, their scope one emissions are somewhere in the region between 10 and 15 million tonnes um, per year. So, you know, we need a lot of these sites around the world. We need a lot of these sites in Victoria, uh, across in WA. And with the two sites that Nick had, uh, had given an overview of, we can be looking at between 10 and 12 million tonnes per year, just off the two sites. 
in context, that's about 10% of Victoria's scope one emissions. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, and staying with the the project there for a moment, um, in terms of the the drilling and the wells, how many wells does it will it take to be able to store that five million tonnes or to grow further? I think the question is based really around how you know how far does it need to go? How many wells do you need? I'll talk to that one. Um, our modelling shows that a single well bore is capable of receiving and safely storing 5 million tonnes per annum. But for an offshore project where if something goes wrong with that well bore, you would need intervention, you need to bring in an offshore rig, uh, re-enter the well bore, that might take six months to organise uh, to get the contracts in place. <clears throat> so we can't afford to have only a single well that gives us a business risk. Uh, our guess is that the best optimum is about three wells, which is the balance between the cost of the wells and the flexibility that it offers to us by having multiple wells. But we're analysing this as part of the uh, front end engineering and design. Uh, exactly how many wells do we need? What is the exact function of each of the wells? Will there be a dedicated monitoring well or will we combine monitoring and injection into the same well bore so we're working through those questions but approximately three wells will be needed for injection great thanks very much nick um amanda if i can throw to you one on community engagement um it's it's if you're in lockdown how are you talking to people it is worth worth noting here that amanda is in um, a region of Australia that is not currently in a lockdown, unlike Alex and I in Melbourne. Um, so Amanda, it's a fair question though, you have been through a lockdown this year. Did, did your community engagement stop? How did you speak to people? Look, we've certainly had to um, think on our feet in regards to the types of activities that we're holding. So for instance, we had a Science Week event um, planned that was going to be an in-person event that this is, it's now a recorded um, experiment. It's our um, uh, Tim Tam experiment that everyone in CCS is probably uh, familiar with, whether you use the Australian Tim Tam biscuit or um, other types of chocolate biscuit. But that is now a video that's been recorded with a worksheet. Um, we've had 245 students sign up to conduct that over five schools. Um, and that will be running in a couple of weeks. We'll be delivering the chocolates and the milk to, the, to each school. Um, so it'll work very differently. It's, it's very different to what we planned at the beginning of the year. Um, likewise, um, a lot of the discussions I'm having are like this. Um, they're either a video conference, phone calls, emails, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, we've had to make a few other changes as well, um, just to, again, to be safe. But I think the technology is there to support us. And it really is thinking outside the box sometimes and seeing how we can get through to our stakeholders um, and keep information coming via video, um, via we're looking at some um, augmented reality um, and that sort of thing in the future. Great, thank you. Um, look, we are, we're we just over time, so I might wrap it up there. If I could ask you all to keep your cameras on as I, as I close the webinar. Um, so throughout, Today's webinar, look, Alex gave an overview of CCS. We've talked about um, facilities and, and data, and certainly if anyone's interested, the Global CCS Institute has a wealth of general information and more detailed information on CCS. Our status report is a great resource to start with, as is our core database, which is a CCS facilities um, and data um, repository. So please check those out. Um, our thought leadership report, the value of CCS, certainly um, speaks to a lot of the themes that have come from today's webinar around the benefits of CCS, especially for regional and rural communities. Um, for further information on the Carbonet project, Steve gave some, some pointers there. There's also the general um, link there to the project information. And in general, we've run, um, I think this is the 11th CCS Talks webinar since March. Please check out the others on our audio and visual library. And just to reiterate, this webinar will be available on that library as of tomorrow and all registrants will be emailed the slides as well as the video and the Carbonet video. Upcoming events and contact with the Institute, please stay in touch with us via our website and also Twitter. Um, 
follow the hashtag CCS Talks for any of the specific information on our webinars. Any questions from today, um, especially ones that weren't answered, want to be followed up, please use the webinar at Institute address um, for membership inquiries, our membership address. And if anyone would like to speak to Alex about consultancy opportunities, please use the info at address as well there. So lots of contacts. And again, please head to our website if you would like to know anything further. So I'd like to close off today by thanking everyone who has joined us from around the world. We had over 600 registrants for today and nearly 300 joined us live. So it's fantastic. Um, thank you all for your interactivity as well. And also a special thanks to our panel members today, Steve, Amanda, Nick and Alex. Thank you for your time and for your thank fantastic you. presentations. Again, I encourage the audience to take Steve up on his offer, contact the CarbonNet project. It's in a really exciting phase of its development and the team is more than happy to speak to you about commercial opportunities and the detail of the project as well. Um, so please do get in touch with CarbonNet. So I'd like to close off there. Thanks everyone again um, for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and um, we hope to see you at another Global CCS webinar soon. Thanks very much.